Today, I'm gonna to give you a tour of a food forest that's over 10 years old. In fact, it's the food forest that I started my permaculture career off with, and it looks absolutely amazing. Before I give you a tour of the property, I wanna just create some context. Nature is all about capturing as much energy as possible. In fact, there's this concept in ecology called the maximum power principle. And it basically states that when an ecosystem gets set up, its primary objective is to capture as much sunlight as possible. Now, when we look at this lawn right here, there's literally one or two species in here, and it's not doing a very good job of capturing, capturing the energy from the sun. Now, let's walk just a little bit down and look at this wall of green. Now, this is a food forest. It's got as many as eight different layers in the canopy. So you've got ground covers, vines, shrubs, bushes, herbs, trees, and so much more fungi. I mean, it's literally teeming with life. So if we climb underneath this canopy, we will not be able to see the sunlight coming through because so much of the sun is being captured by this food forest. Now we sold this property about four years ago and since then it has absolutely exploded. Let's go walk into the food forest. I'll point out some of the species as well as some of the nuanced design that most people won't recognize when they first walk into this space. So this front part here is what I call a fedge. It's a fruit hedge and it was designed actually for my neighbors to steal the fruit. And so when they're walking along here, this has recently been harvested, but you can literally get about 50 pounds of cherries off of each and every one of these shrubs. And so I would hide up in the window over there and watch my neighbors as they stole the fruit, which was great because I was showing them that they didn't have to grow a lawn. They could actually grow cherries instead. This is an angelica plant. And so it has really, really tiny flowers on it and it actually attracts all the beneficial insects in. Flowers are really important in any food forest that you build. Behind me is a, a goji berry. And so this is a nitrogen fixing shrub that produces berries. They're actually related to the tobacco family. And when they're fresh, these berries actually don't taste very good. But when you dry them out, it tastes actually really, really good. So if you have a goji berry, it's important that you dehydrate these. And these kind of just perpetually produce. Like there are so many green berries on here that this is gonna be a really good year for the goji. We've got another cherry right here. Um, we've got a Saskatoon right there. We've got rhubarb, raspberries, lilies. Um, there's no flowers on here right now, but lilies are actually a really delicious edible flower that you can put into your salads. We've got some daisies and this is a comfrey plant. It's kind of a famous permaculture plant. Um, normally I'd have a rice knife on me, but basically you just chop and drop it. So this will come back multiple times per year and you just literally chuck it down on the ground. That's creating a nice mulch layer for the tree and this will break down and, and give nutrients to the soil, which is kind of cool. Another cherry right here, some uh, currants. We planted lots of currants in here. Um, one of my favorite shrubs in this ecosystem is the honeyberry. Uh, these produce little blueberry sized berries. And uh, this little place here is where my kids used to come and hide. There's like a little niche in the forest here. And so they would come and hide under this bush and then pick the berries. More comfrey, more currants, more rhubarb. And then over here is a really cool little feature. It kind of gets hidden. Look at these raspberries right here. They're just starting to go off. Beautiful. Raspberries are so prolific in this environment. So this system here captures all the rainwater from the roof, about 15,000 liters per year. And it comes down into this rain head, which takes off any of the debris from the roof, comes into the tank. And as soon as the tank is full enough, it actually overflows through this pipe right here. And this pipe goes underground and feeds the food forest. And so it will actually put water into the swale. And so it sub irrigates all of these trees, which is why they're growing so prolifically. And I mean, again, just look at the contrast of this system versus this system right here. It's like day and night. If we come onto this side, we see we have a whole bunch of different types of plants. So we've got a sea buckthorn right here. This plant is incredible. It's a, got a male and a female. So there's a Male is over there, the female is right here with the berries. These leaves sell for an incredible amount of money for tea and you can make really nice tea out of them. And if you actually crush the berries once they're producing with the leaves and then put hot water on there, it's a very medicinal plant. And the, the Russian military used to use this with their pilots to improve eyesight. And if you look sea buckthorn up online, you'll find all sorts of incredible medicinal benefits from them. This apple tree is just blowing my mind. I planted it when it was this big and now I can't even touch the top anymore. We have about two or three grafts on here. I can't remember exactly. I've found one right here, but basically this tree produces about three different varieties of apples. So this branch is from a, an apple variety from the Okanagan. You can kind of see the change of the bark right here. These apples here are hardy Macintosh. And Adrian's done some pretty cool stuff. He's actually planted a hop 
vine in the tree. And so again, really allowing for all that maximal solar collection within the system. Some more currents and really nice wide pathways here so you can get access to all of your, your plants. And one of the coolest things in permaculture, we've got this saying, work is a failure in design. And so in this food forest, it pretty much self-manages itself. There's no garden gnomes running around pulling weeds. There's an occasional pruning here or there. And obviously the most amount of work is coming in and collecting all the food that gets generated in this system. But it really is this self-perpetuating system that if we walked away from it, it would end up becoming a beneficial ruin. And I love that concept of beneficial ruins. Beneficial ruins are, you know, there's plenty of ruins that humanity has left like the pyramids. This in itself is a living ruin. And if we walked away from it, it would just get better every single year. It would get more productive. It would create more habitat, all because we got the design right. I'm going to show you another really cool thing that very few people know about in this food forest. Let's go take a look. So the other side of the food forest gets 15,000 liters of water from the roof, specifically from the east roof. But this side wasn't getting any water from that top roof. So one day I went over to my neighbors when the Calgary Flames game was going on with a case of Budweiser beer. And I said, dude, can I harvest your rainwater? You're not doing anything with it. He's like, have at it. And so every year that one case of Budweiser gets this food forest 15,000 liters of water and it just goes subsurface underneath and again feeds those trees passively without any additional intervention on our behalf. And so we're always looking for these little tiny wins that allow us to get more with less. And this is a perfect example of it. It creates community, it reduces the stormwater management issues in the city and it helps to grow an abundant food forest, which creates habitat for all sorts of species, as well as some incredible berries that when we were living here, my family was able to eat. Now, most people don't know this about permaculture, but people think about permaculture as organic gardening on steroids. And so food forests and gardens and greenhouses, but we actually get pretty concerned about how our houses are built as well. So it gets really cold here. It gets down to minus 40. That's when Fahrenheit and Celsius become friends and it can be there for a couple of weeks. And so one of the things that we wanted to do with the house was actually to re-insulate it. And so we went from an R7, which is the insulation value of the wall, to almost R32 in this wall. And in the attic, we went from about an R10 to an R60. And so in doing that, we ended up tightening the house up, reducing its energy consumption to almost nothing so that we were able to stay comfortable through winter. So not only are we getting a lot of our berries and our food from our garden and our food forest, but we're also able to minimize the amount of thermal energy that our house requires in order to stay warm through the winter time. And I'll show you a couple of other cool things that we did to the house when we go to the backyard. This garden is just going off. Uh, you know, this is a non-traditional way of growing food. So people that have grown up with traditional, you know, row-based gardens might look at this and say, this is a bit ugly, but it's not ugly at all in my opinion. I mean, we've got all the same principles of a forest architecture going on with our vegetables. We've got carrots and, and spinach and lamb's quarter. We've even got a couple of wheat plants here, probably from the mulch. We've got all sorts of brassicas and flowers and it's all in this like milieu of, of, of plants, this ocean of plants right, right in front of us. And everything just looks so vibrant. The colors are just popping, which tells me that the soil looks really, really fantastic. And this is one of the things with permaculture is it's so, unconventional but when you start understanding that plants just like humans like to live in community you start being able to assemble them in ways that you've never thought about before and there's just so many benefits to getting these plants connected like this one of which is that there's no weeds in a system like this there's no light coming down to actually allow those weeds to grow flowers also play a really important role in an annual vegetable garden and so this is from the umble plant and it's actually a dill plant and so the umble is actually latin for umbrella which is why you've got this umbrella shaped flower system. And all of the parasitic wasps love to come and pollinate these flowers. And so if you've got a pest problem in your garden, in permaculture, what you do is you just attract the predators. And so by having plants like dill, you're actually creating habitat for the predators. And so they take care of the pests for you. Aquatic ecosystems are about 28 times more productive than terrestrial ones. So every permaculture property should have some sort of a water element. And it's probably hard to see it on the camera right now, but this is a small little tire pond. And you'll notice that it gets filled up from water from this roof. When the water overflows this little tire, it goes down into the pathway and it sub irrigates these gardens. So again, we're always thinking about water access and structures. So I told you that I'd show you some of the other features of this house that we innovated on. And so this evacuated tube solar collector provides about 80% of the hot water inside the house. So we're using the sun, not just to grow our vegetables, but also to heat our hot water. 
which really reduces the amount of natural gas that is required in order to have showers and wash dishes. Another thing that we did is we added these light tubes onto the house. And so those actually go right through the ceiling, which allows us to have naturally lit spaces inside the house for most of the year without ever having to turn a light on. In fact, it's pretty funny because the bathroom, which is right there, has one of those light tubes. And when guests would come over to use the washroom, they'd get really confused because they couldn't figure out how to turn off the light. And so by having those light tubes, it allows us to have a power-free lighting solution for most of the year. It might just look that I'm standing on top of a regular brick patio, but underneath me is a rainwater harvesting tank that's about 4,000 liters. And so the water from this roof comes down, this downspout right here, and it runs down this patio into this scupper, which ends up in a tank right here, and it allows us to irrigate the back garden all year round. Now when the tank is overflowing and there's no more room for water, there's actually a, an overflow right here. It comes out of this pipe and it feeds into this swale right here, which sub-irrigates the entire garden on that side. One of the most important things in a permaculture project is community. And this is the outdoor kitchen from the property. Um, this is one of the first workshops that we held as Verge Permaculture, where we put together this cob oven. And I've literally fed thousands and thousands of people back here with this little tiny cob oven. Actually, it's not tiny, it's large. Um, I can get about three pizzas in here at any given time, and the pizzas take anywhere from 30 to 60 seconds to cook. So I can whip them out as quick as we can make them over on the kitchen there. And uh, relationships started um, out of this, marriages started out of this. This whole space became alive with people on a regular basis throughout the summer just by creating an outdoor community space on our property. This project was Michelle's and my first permaculture project. And for every dollar in the bank, we have $10,000 in relationships. That was one of the best things that came out of our permaculture design course. And so if you're looking for like-minded individuals, you're looking to grow your own nutrient-dense food, take control of the energy supply chains that you require, and surround yourself with incredible people that are aiming at similar things, then you're gonna to wanna to check out the permaculture design course this fall. It's gonna be hosted live online on the Verge site and we get together multiple times per week. We answer all of your questions and we have an incredible academy of staff with over 400 years of combined experience in all of the different domains that permaculture touches. If you're interested in finding out more about that course, I've left a link in the show notes down below and shoot us an email. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer any of them. Hopefully we'll see you in the next course.